everyone, Lynn Smith here, and welcome to Stroller Coaster, the podcast that takes you on the wild ride of parenting that we're all on together, created by Munchkin. No wonder they're the most loved baby brand in the world. And we are back. Season three, I've missed you guys. I have. I've missed this podcast. I missed the lessons, Justin. Yes. Uh. Justin here, my producer, as always. How have you been? I've been well. Uh, I've been well. I, yeah, my parenting gets worse when we're not doing this. So it's great to be back. All right, let's kick off season three. We have such a great episode to kick us off. Julian Lennon is here, someone who does a ton of work. He's making the world a better place through his children's books and humanitarian efforts. Also, Grammy nominated, making some pretty incredible music that you'll hear. It's going to be fun. We're also going to sit down with Katie Moore from IFA the International Fund for Animal Welfare, a great organization. And Katie's going to give us tips, simple things we can do every day to connect our kids to animals and the planet. So these are things you can do right in your own backyard. Let's get started. Here we go. What a special episode we have for you today. I'm sitting down with children's book author, philanthropist, musician, and son of John Lennon of the Beatles. Julian Lennon is joining me. So let's get right to it. Julian, thank you so much for being with me. Likewise. My pleasure. These books really spoke to me as a parent. We need our children to understand what is happening. And you write a series of these books. It's Touch the Earth, Heal the Earth, and Love the Earth. First, what inspired you to do this? It was actually thanks to a dear friend. I was about to start considering writing a memoir because I figured I'd better start now before it's too late on many <laughs> levels. And I was going to write it with a dear friend of mine who's the co-writer on these projects, Bart Davis. And he was looking at all the other work that I was doing. And he said, this is all great stuff, Jules. What about writing a book for kids? Take all that embodies the White Feather Foundation and all the good and all the subject matter that the White Feather Foundation looks after and put it in a way that children can understand. And I started thinking and, and thinking of the many times that I recalled sitting enveloped and embraced by my mum or, or grandmother cradled on the bed with a book in between us uh, and going on a journey, both together, both reading. The more I thought about it, it was more about starting a conversation with the children, building a relationship with what was being said. But also the idea was that as you're reading things, you know, that your child would go, but why don't they have clean water? Or why is there plastic in the sea? And this was also to trigger, hopefully, the minds of the parents into re-engaging with the issues at hand, the problems that we face, and for them to realize that, because I, uh, we all have busy lives, and for them to realize that, you know, the parents need to be mindful beyond uh, in regards to what kind of world their kids are going to be growing up in. You know what we have is a clip from your audiobook. Take a listen. The oceans connect us all to each other, and some of the most wondrous creatures in our world live there. So why do we dump plastic into our water? Plastic is poison to sea creatures. Let's love them enough to protect them. Press the land button and get ready to help. It's so wonderful. You know, one of the things I love about these books is that it sparks curiosity. It certainly did for my boys. And, and it takes readers on this journey that feels interactive. When you make ideas like this interactive, it's just a total game changer for kids. Yeah, I think for me, at least, many of the books that I read as a kid, I remember back then the journeys and the books that I read. I think it's a very important time. And the growth of a child between three and five and six or whatever, seven. And to me, that was key, was finding that age group that would just be at that point of beyond curiosity. Something in the book that really struck me is how you go directly into the ocean to show children what is happening with plastic. You go all yeah. over the world. What are some of the yeah. things that you want parents to take away when it comes to these books? I think they're just, again, they've got to be more conscious of how they're living their lives too. You know, there are solutions. There are absolutely solutions out there. It's about getting enough people behind that. Too many people are 
are just ignoring the problem and thinking it'll go away, but it's not going away. None of it's going away. That's key for me moving forward. And so whether that's more books for kids, knowledge is power. Indeed. That's great. Julian, you do so many things. Your organization, the White Feather Foundation, very busy around the world from caring for our oceans to bringing clean water to people who don't have it. How did the White Feather Foundation first come about? I was actually touring in Australia and I was in the hotel and I kept getting calls from the hotel downstairs saying, listen, we have a group of people downstairs, camera crews, and we also have an indigenous tribe down here that all want to speak to you. And I thought it was like one of those on the road pranks. I'm going, yes, of course, sure there is. Anyway, they kept calling and said, no, this is real. So I go downstairs and, uh, It's a semicircle of 30 people, maybe more, maybe less, and this indigenous tribe. And this elder woman, I meet her in the middle, hands over a white feather, and she says to me, can you help us? You have a voice. Mm. And then the question in my head was, do I just carry on being a rock and roller or do I step up to the plate? And I said, yeah, of course I can, for the children, of course. The sideline here is the fact that Dad had said to me, and I couldn't tell you when or where, but it stuck with me because I thought it was something rather unusual to say to a son. But he said to me, if something ever happens to me, the way that I'll let you know that either I'm going to be okay, meaning him, and or that we're all going to be okay, will be in the form of a white feather. So when I received the white feather from one of the oldest cultures and indigenous tribes in the world. Yeah, I got goosebumps. Mm. Um, And that, to me, undeniable sign. Mm. Yeah, whatever your beliefs are, I'm not religious, but I certainly am spiritual. I believe in energies, et cetera, and balance and hopefully peace. But that that was a sign for me, undeniable. So I started the White Feather Foundation. I just felt that I could do more and do better. So looking forward, what are some of the pressing issues you're focusing on with your work? I think health and education. That's part and parcel why I did the books. Because in Kenya, I was visiting schools and seeing the fact that they just didn't have enough support. I guess one of the main things I'm most proud of is that I set up a scholarship for girls in my mother's name, the Cynthia Lennon Scholarship. And we try to put a number of girls through university and college. They want to come back to their own community, better armed with information Mm -hmm. and knowledge and better ways to help their community moving forward. What do you have as advice for us? What do you want us parents to do to continue to help the message of the White Feather Foundation and also the protection of our environment? Keep pushing the idea that change is absolutely possible for the better, that it it can start with one person and grow to many, and anything and everything is possible if you put your heart and mind and soul to it. Every element of work that I do, a generous proportion goes to the White Feather Foundation to keep the projects alive that we do. And we survive on, on donations alone, literally donations. So from the public out there. You buy more children's books, you help the White Feather Foundation with clean water, health and education, protection of indigenous tribes and their environment and their culture and their land. So every little helps. That's all I'll say. Amazing. It's so great to meet you, Julian. And before we go, I want to give our listeners the chance to hear your music. Here's a clip called Lucky Ones from Julian's new album, Jude. And make sure to stay tuned for the full song at the end of the episode. Searching, trying to find a new religion So peace of mind Peace of mind Don't want to let go of all of my intuition I need a sign That love is blind I feel a change is coming It might not be forever, but I know 
a beautiful song from Julian's new album, Jude, that song called Lucky Ones. Justin, a fun talk with Julian. He's doing really incredible work. Yeah, he's sort of doing it all, it feels like. He's got his real, uh, like, world-level humanitarian Mm -hmm. uh, projects and then uh, writing just a series of children's books on the side. And so interactive. That's what I think is really fun. Yeah, and uh, we actually have a special collection put together by our friends over at Munchkin that features Julian's books and some great Munchkin products. Oh, what are all the goodies? Um, all three of Julian's books, Touch the Earth, Heal the Earth, and Love the Earth, the Wild Bath Squirts from Munchkin, which are fun, a set of Miracle hmm. 360 Wild Love Cups, and a Wild Love Placemat. Just a little something we put together to kick off Season 3. And you get all this for $73.99. Check it out. You can find the link in the show notes. Justin, the great part here, sales from the collection support Munchkin's donation to IFA, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and the White Feather Foundation. So it's going to something really good. I'm so excited for this next interview. We all love nature here at Stroller Coaster. We love animals and also being outside. I love to do this with my children, connecting to nature. So we have Katie Moore. She's the Deputy Vice President of Animal Rescue at IFAW, and she shares with us some really simple things we can do with our kids to get them closer to nature, which I feel like we all need right now more than ever. Katie, tell me a little bit about IFAW, what it is that you do. Oh, I love my job, first of all. (laughs) IFAW is a really great organization where we are focused on a combination of rescuing individual animals and conservation. So for me, I work on things like rescuing animals from natural disasters or dolphin strandings, taking animals and making sure that they're getting back into their habitat and orphaned animals. And then we're also trying to protect landscapes, whether it's rainforests or savannas or part of the ocean. And all of that might sound abstract to the listener, right? We don't see that dolphin. We don't see an elephant, but you you really talk about how important it is to develop a connection with our children and the environment. What do you mean by that? It's important for kids to understand that there's more to the world than just what's right in front of them. The world is a lot bigger than that. When you're walking out in your backyard and you find that little caterpillar and you're picking it up and looking at it and you put it back in a, in a spot where you know it's going to flourish and continue to grow, Caring about that one little caterpillar then is an entry point to caring about the bigger world because you can then talk about, you know, why does it matter? Why do we care about that one little organism? And then that applies to so many bigger things. You know, kids aren't tainted yet. They're so open to ideas and they're so imaginative that this is where the light bulb goes on and they start to explore and have their own ideas about the difference they can make in the world. Introducing kids to the nature around them, to the the small animals they might see, definitely allows them to build that sense of compassion. That's what I want. I want my child to be a compassionate human. And that carries into everything that we do, whether we're protecting the environment or caring for one another in our communities. What's an example that you've seen in your own children or in other children of how it makes them more compassionate? I have a child who now will, on a rainy day, go out and be like, wait, there's worms in the driveway. We have to move them back over to the side. I mean, it all starts from a very young age, and kids are natural scientists, and they're so curious. Kids can be natural nurturers, too. Mm -hmm. You know, at IFA, we're dealing with everything from elephants and and dolphins and whales down to tiny lizards and little birds. And Mm -hmm. every one of the animals has a place in their ecosystem in the world, and that's why we want to protect them and their habitat. Julian mentioned this, that real change can start with just one person. And it's kind of our responsibilities as a parent to be proactive in teaching our children how to protect the environment. What are some of the things we can do in our own backyard that would help and what your mission is at IFA? First of all, spending more time outside. Whether you live in the city and you're going to the local park or whether you have a big backyard that you get to go explore in. Do a natural or a nature scavenger hunt. And it's great for any age. What kinds of leaves can they find? What kinds of animals might they see? Would they see a bee? Would they see a butterfly? And we actually did this during COVID because the kids needed to get outside more. Kids with a piece of paper and literally a little crayon, and they're just checking off what they've seen, and they get very excited. They're really natural learners. So teaching them to be lifelong learners, you know, kind of raising an environmentalist. If we're looking around the world and we want to make a difference, these are the folks that are going to 
have the big ideas and be in a position to help us make that change. Yeah, I love you say raise an environmentalist. I mean, we all know, like we teach our kids to recycle and they recycle in Mm -hmm. school and they're doing all of those little things. But there are things that they can feel empowered to do on their own. Little things that I, I did with my niece when she was small for my brother's pool. She was really upset because they had little frogs and little critters that would end up in their pool. And so we did some investigating and found out there are great things that you can buy or make, but they're like little lily pads. They float on the edge of the pool and they have a little bridge that goes up and they're kind of anchored with a little weight so that critters that get into the pool by accident can get out. And it's little things like that to feel like you can make that difference. And she loves it. And she's much older now and it's still something that she's very in tune to. What about planting foods to eat? We had a garden and the boys were so excited to just run out and get like the tomatoes for the day. What does that teach them? I love this. We always have a garden. You know, it's everything from planting the seed to watering it and and nurturing it. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of pride that they get from, oh, I'm I'm doing this. And then you harvest. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have access to a space outside or a big plot to have a garden, it's really easy to do even just a little pot inside where you can do herbs that then can be used while you're cooking. And so then you get to be a part of that whole process from planting the seed right right through to eating dinner and, and being able to enjoy that. Another thing we can do right in our own backyard, and it's the perfect time of year right now because we're getting it to the point where I know that my husband's a little frustrated. He wants to clean up the yard. You can have one pile of leaves that you're going to jump in. Mm-hmm. And this year, we're making sure that we don't clean up all the leaves. There are a lot of animals that really rely on that, that what we call leaf litter to overwinter. So like the little woolly bear caterpillars are a great example of that. They need to be in that leaf litter. Um, a lot of the pollinators um, that we're going to rely on for our gardens and for the flowers that are out there. So we want to leave some of that. And so if you really want to clean up your yard, what we're going to do this year at our place is take some of those leaves and put them into our gardens, which serves a couple of purposes. It, it, it gives those animals a space to overwinter, and it also then becomes mulch in your garden. But it's a great opportunity to look through that. What animals are you seeing? What's right in your own backyard, which sometimes we don't pay attention to, but kids get really into it. And once you turn them onto it, they keep looking. Something that we learned about how important it is to help injured animals. There was a little baby raccoon that had just been born. The mom wasn't anywhere to be found. And we just Googled what to do because you have no idea. And you're supposed to leave a box overnight with paper towels to keep it warm. And we came back the next day and mom hadn't returned for this ringtail raccoon. So we, we took it to a local wildlife refuge And the boys came with us and they saw all the animals and they put the baby raccoon, which they named Ringy, into an incubator Mm -hmm. and they fed Ringy. And now every single time we walk by the tree where we found that raccoon, they're like, that's where Ringy was. Absolutely. And kids remember everything. Their brains aren't full yet, but (sighs) kids remember those things, especially when there's an, an emotional connection. Your kids felt like they made a difference for that one animal. So they're going to remember that forever. We all felt great. Those types of things as a family are really, really impactful. So one of the ways that kids can get involved is through this art contest that you have. Can you tell me about that? Oh, this is amazing. It is associated around World Wildlife Day, and it's just a great opportunity. I consider kids to be natural scientists. They're also natural artists. What kid doesn't want to pick up either a pencil, paper, crayons, paint, whatever it might be, And any age, you know, little Mm -hmm. tiny kids up to teenagers, and it gives them a chance to express themselves. We had kids from over 60 countries putting this artwork in. Some really have a lot of, like, conservation messaging just as a, a visual, which I think is amazing. I just love the way that kids see the world and then express that. If folks want to go to ifa.org, you can actually get a link to the upcoming contest. It will open soon, and then the winner is chosen on March 3rd. Love it. Katie, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you. This was wonderful. Justin, I love all these tips, but something that uh, we did in COVID was our school assigned the kids a nature scavenger hunt. It like got them outside. And I love that she mentioned this. Yes. And my mom uh, sets one up at uh, upstate New York where she lives. So when we go up there over the summer, it's a summer long scavenger hunt. (gasps) And my kids, my, my sister's kids, they go crazy for it. They Wait, so all summer long, how does she do this? Is she always having different things planted? 
Uh, well, no, it's more like, can you find a newt? Um, uh, you need to find leeks growing in the wild. Like, it's all these things you have to find over the course of the summer. And it's it lights them up so much because it's a little competitive. And so we'll be back in New York, and my daughter will be like, hey, is that is that a four leaf clover over there? Because we I we gotta go mark it on the on the scavenger hunt board, and I'm like, yes, yes, we got it. So they're playing year year Aww. round, really. And that just goes to show that children love this. They eat this up when you give them the opportunity to. So she gave us some really great ideas here. We can value and appreciate nature. And that's the show. Thanks so much for taking the wild ride with us. And I want to thank Julian Lennon and Katie Moore from IFA. And just remember, when you go out there and you buy any of the Wild Love products, you are supporting Munchkin's donation to the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And of course, we want to thank you for listening. That's why we do this. We want to share this with your friends, your play dates. So share the show, spread the word, and thank you to Munchkin. No wonder they're the most loved baby brand in the world. You can find all your favorite Munchkin products at munchkin.com and at Tesco stores nationwide in the United Kingdom. Here at Stroller Coaster, we're all about community. So if you have a question, if you have a topic you want to hear more about, just reach out to us. Email us at podcast at munchkin.com. Okay, Justin, you got to let people know about story time. This is so fun for the parents and their kids. Yes, um, we have a bonus for you. Stroller Coaster Storytime is a podcast we do that's perfect for kids. We take your classic children's stories and fairy tales and we update them, make them fun and funny. Uh, Lynn, you're familiar with Little Red Riding Hood? Well, sure. Well, we upgraded her and made her Little Red Riding sneakers. Here's a clip. Little Red Riding sneakers didn't get very far into the big, big woods when she saw the wolf. Hello, Little Red Riding sneakers. Ooh, your sneakers are looking fresh. So fresh. So fresh. Ah, that's adorable. That's what's so fun about it. It's creative. Exactly. And you can find Stroller Coaster Storytime right here in the same feed. And now something we do every show. It's the moment of calm where we just take a break. And in honor of our guest, Julian Lennon, Let's take a listen to more of his song, The Lucky Ones, from his new album, Jude. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Everyone is searching, trying to find a new religion. So peace of mind, peace of mind. Don't want to let go of all of my intuition I need a sign If love is blind I feel a change is coming I know A new revolution's knocking on my door I feel a change is coming So strong It might not be Did we cross the line? 